but now I'm going to say uh, bonjour to Elodie uh, from, would you like to share your screen, sure. Elodie, from the Ecole Normale Supérieure Paris, Sarclay in France. Elodie is contributing for the first time uh, as a co-author with Patrice Laroche, a chapter on France. And each contributor has a maximum of 10 minutes uh, to speak, which will allow us time for some discussion later. So, allons-y, Elodie. Okay, great, thank you very much. Well, hello everyone. I'm very pleased to participate to this session this morning in France. And of course, I would have loved to meet you all in Lund. Uh, so my name is Elodie Betou. I am a sociologist working at the Ecole Normale Supérieure Paris-Saclay. And as Greg said, uh, my presentation is based on a chapter that I co-authored with my colleague Patrice Laroche with a professor in HR and labor studies at the Nancy School of Management. So, um, here it is. So um, I will start with briefly uh, recalling the main characteristics of the French model of employment relations. France uh, is sometimes referred to as a mixed market economy to underline its kind of paradoxical situation. For instance, as you probably know, it combines one of the lowest rates of unionization with one of the highest collective bargaining coverage, thanks to the state extension mechanism. The French model is in fact well known for resting on strong state intervention in employment relations, as well as on comprehensive social legislation. Actors are characterized by a long tradition of multi-unionism and by shifting strategies of employer organization. Um, from the late 1990s on in particular, employers have been explicitly favoring company level bargaining that they were long wary of. The French model is organized around a three-tier system of regulation and bargaining, articulating national, sector, and company-level negotiations. The sector level, the industry level, has long been standing at the core of this system. At workplace level, we have a dual system of employee representation with union delegates on the one hand and elected bodies on the other one, both ensuring a quite significant presence of unions in the workplace, at least for companies with over 50 employees. And finally, from a socioeconomic perspective, uh, the context is one of lasting high unemployment. Um, apart from these very general characteristics, I think the French case is interesting in uh, regarding its state-led process of decentralization. Uh, the process itself has been developing over the past 30 to 40 years now, but the last decade is particularly notable because of an accelerated pace of labor law reforms. Uh, these reforms have changed the employment relation dynamics quite significantly. They have also led to greater legal instability in France and to increased controversies among unions in particular, with some of them giving their conditional support to the reforms while others were strongly opposing them. One of the main bones of contentions uh, lies in the fact that these reforms mean shifting away from the traditional hierarchical scheme, the scheme through which law was prevailing over sector agreements, which were themselves prevailing over company, uh, company agreements. Yet, um, I would say that this shift is not so much about reversing the traditional hierarchy itself, making company agreements systematically prevailing. It's more about threatening the autonomy of each level of regulation and widening the scope of company level bargaining. To give you a quick uh, overview of these reforms and changes, we could state the, their four main objectives. First, uh, the first objective is threatening company level bargaining. The aim of several of these reforms was clearly to anchor union activity and union legitimacy more firmly in the workplace. Thus, new rules were designed to govern collective agreements validity on the one side, and more importantly, to redefine union representativeness. 
So in that perspective, uh, the 208 law stands at the turning point insofar as unions now have to prove their representativeness by first passing an electoral test, which was not the case at all before him. Um, the second aim was to reorganize sector level bargaining. And this was achieved through a significant merging process, which uh, was, was going from more than 700 sectoral collective agreements in 2015 to some 250 nowadays. Uh, the third step was redefining the dual workplace employee representation system. So from 2020 on, the long established representative elected bodies, such as personnel delegates, works councils, health and safety committees, have been merged and replaced by the new and single committee, which is called the Social and Economic Committee. It should be noted that the process of negotiating and setting up these new committees at company level has been partially conducted during the pandemic crisis. So this obviously has hindered the process or at least made it more difficult in some cases. Finally, these various reforms have tried to address the employee representation deficit in SMEs. SMEs represent more than 40% of the total workforce in France, and obviously this issue is nothing new. But it was put in the forefront recently during the 2018-2019 Yellow Vest movement. This vast political protest movement that you have certainly heard of questioned the capacity of unions to represent all workers, including independent ones and workers from small enterprises. So we don't have time to discuss whether these reforms have indeed led to a truly decentralized system or not. But I suggest that looking at how the COVID-19 crisis has been dealt with in France can show us how important the three levels of regulation still are. France has experienced three lockdowns from spring 2020 to spring 2021. In this context, as in many uh, other European countries, the French government has politically and financially supported a significant use of short time activity and a massive use of remote working. Um, first, national level social dialogue has been quite intense over the past 15 years, with several national agreements being concluded on vocational training, on pension and unemployment schemes or labor market reforms. It's been the case also in the context of the COVID-19 crisis with two uh, national agreements being concluded lately. The first one was concluded in November 2020 to define guidelines and principles on the use of remote working. It was obviously directly linked to the pandemic and its consequences. A second one was concluded in December 2020 on health at work. This agreement was initially linked, was not, sorry, initially linked to the pandemic. In fact, it has been discussed for over two years now. But obviously, it has been much debated at the end in relation to the pandemic crisis as it reshapes the system to manage health issues at work. At sector level, uh, I would like to mention the consultation dynamics that the COVID-19 crisis has fueled, especially along about second line workers and their challenging employment and working conditions in sectors such as cleaning, retail, transport or agriculture. Finally, dealing with the crisis has been a test for company level social dialogue, especially had it was gaining ground, as I said, and was strongly promoted by public policies. So globally speaking, in large companies at least, social dialogue has been intensified during the crisis with more numerous and more regular meetings, for instance. But what we can see is that it has also been more centralized within the company, being conducted at the central level rather than at the workplace level itself. And sometimes it was conducted bypassing regular representative bodies through uh, the use of ad hoc committees. Um, as I refer here to the case of large companies, I would like to end this presentation by mentioning an innovative French initiative that relates to the debate on regulating multinational enterprises activities on a global scale and along the global value chain. 
the 2017 French law on corporate duty of vigilance was adopted after a four-year debate and process. It requires French MNEs to identify the social, human, and environmental risks which are associated not only with their own activities, but also with the activities from their subsidiaries, their subcontractors, and their suppliers. The law also requires them to take measures to prevent these risks, and this assessment has to be made on an annual basis. This uh, 2017 law has been considered as an important one for at least three reasons. First, because it judicializes corporate social responsibility practices in contrast with corporate voluntary initiatives which have been prevailing so far. In this case, it gives such practices a legal basis and it makes it possible to sue companies that would not meet the legal requirements, thus raising excuse the question. Moi, which, yes? Excusez-moi. Um, your time is up. Okay, um, can I, I, you, I'm, can I'm you done. Conclude, sure. Uh, so, th so the first uh, reason is judicializing CSR practices. The second one was simply that the law is trying to hold together social and environmental issues and to make them both a topic for social dialogue. And finally, the French law has been seen as a potential model for other national regulation and EU regulation. And I just wanted to mention the prospect of a, EU re of a European directive in 2022, which is currently uh, under discussion. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Elodie, for covering France for us and raising some issues so concisely and in such an interesting way. Thank you. And Ni Hao, uh, to my friend and colleague, Fang Lee Cook, would you like to share your screen with us, Fang? Uh, Fang is a fellow professor at Monash University here in Melbourne. Yeah, so uh, the context of industrial relations in China is that, uh, uh, thanks for our French uh, co-authors um, uh, presentation, uh, which highlights a lot of the kind of the role of the union, the changes and the uh, bargaining system. But in the Chinese context, the role of the state is uh, very influential and it continues to play a very influential role in shaping the industrial relations uh, via its agencies at all level, including the local governments and the tra uh, trade union organizations. Now in China, the trade unions are not operating independently from any party. Um, it is, there is only one officially recognized trade union, which is um, uh, under the leadership or direction of the Chinese Communist Party as one of the mass uh, organization in China. And uh, the All China Federation of Trade Union, ACFTU, um, has no rights to organize strikes or, collect, uh, or collective actions or industrial actions, but it, it does have the rights and responsibility to participate in this bill resolution, um, mainly through uh, as a kind of mediation, a mediation role. Um, also, there is a trend of the government uh, through its local agency or, or uh, lo uh, local legal authority to dismantle the collective IR or collective dispute uh, by breaking them up into smaller uh, and individual kind of dispute uh, in order to avoid a collective uh, outbreak of uh, yeah, events. And about 60% of the workforce are in non-standard employment particularly uh, a large proportion of them are the uh, rural migrant workers. Um, they don't have a lot of bargaining power and they are not well organized. Then uh, there is also the, um, the, the impact of the COVID-19 on employment and business response. So I was asked by the uh, chairs of this session to focus a little bit more on the COVID-19 and the responses. So. Um, the last year, initially after the COVID-19 uh, broke out and there was lockdown, and then after the work was resumed, um, companies were not having uh, sufficient order initially, so they had to lay off workers, particularly the manufacturing workers, and or have to stand uh, workers down and reduce working hours. Uh, or also, many businesses, where possible, they changed the business mode to online like many other countries have done. And 
So all these have impact on workers and their earnings as well. And also uh, when companies try to uh, organize some of the business activities and accommodate workers in a kind of innovative mode, um, it creates new legal uh, issues. For example, some factories, because they're not requiring so many workers to work, um, they second the workers out to the service sector like Korea and uh, fast takeaway and this uh, um, Korea dispatch and those kind of line of work. Then it creates a kind of legal ambiguity where the employees belong, and especially when they have a work-related injury. So who is going to cover the cost? So that creates a kind of um, a situation. Another development uh, in terms of business response to the COVID-19 was the um, rapid um, adoption of automation in, through industrial robots in the factory. So the adoption of industry robots have began, begun actually before COVID-19, but the pace has gathered since COVID-19 um, because companies feel that they can avoid the kind of, uh, this kind of lockdown situation or uh, labor shortage as well. And also the uh, Chinese government has promoted the 5G and uh, digitalization a lot more uh, rapidly. So therefore it makes the uh, industrialization, uh, sorry, uh, ro industrial robots and um, automation much more quickly. But in the in China, the situation is that we have 50 million of uh, rural migrant workers uh, operating or uh, floating around in, in urban area wanting jobs. And at the same time, we have over 8 million uh, young university graduates graduating each year and they need jobs. And the majority of them find uh, jobs in a kind of uh, informal employment or temporary employment. So that again has implications for collectivism or workers' representation and also decent work. Government, uh, in terms of the response, uh, industrial response uh, in the COVID-19, and also in the last year, the intensifying trade war, and many of you would have seen the trade war, particularly between the US and the Chinese uh, government, uh, so the government has taken a range of actions. Uh, stabilizing employment was the top priority in the post-COVID-19 recovery. And it has a kind of top-down policy uh, enforcement implemented by the local government and other state-controlled institutional actors, uh, particularly at the lower uh, government level. So basically, it is we are seeing a very much of a top-down kind of mode uh, in terms of um, operating. So um, the trade union actually does not seem to have a much publicity or much of the action other than supporting the government to develop training for the workers and try to find jobs to for those unemployed and particularly organize the rural migrant workers that do not have jobs to have more training and help them to find work in their hometown through the local industrialization process. Um, so all these have been the kind of main activities. Um, particularly also, there is a, a big wave of promoting digitalization in a wide range of business functions and to shift the economic structure. The government has launched an initiative of a, a internal circular economy. So basically by trying to incentivize uh, internal um, economic uh, demands and supply. Oh, um, I think my, uh, then final uh, slide is the future prospect of employment and industrial relations. Um, COVID-19 has led to the strengthening of this uh, state control and the role of the state, uh, I have to say, um, which is going to continue for some time. And we have seen that uh, the state has kind of um, stepped up to, uh, to organize by a wide range of activities, especially in the COVID-19, uh, after the COVID-19, and or actually it's not after, there is still kind of localized outbreaks. And so um, it's, we see a much more kind of a proactive organization from the state, so therefore, when we talk about the tripartite system or the, the three uh, key state institutional actors, and in fact, at the moment, it is the state 
that was playing a lot more of the function. And informal employment will continue to grow, especially the gig economy and the service sector as well. Uh, employer, employers will are speeding up the process of, uh, uh, of production automation and also digitalization of the business process. And so there will be a major impact on worker skills, job opportunities and quality as well. Um, it is unlikely to see, uh, un, it is unclear how trade union can help to organize workers and, and help to raise the job quality without the role of the state being the kind of more dominant kind of uh, player. Um, so, um, but these developments will impact the nature of industrial relations and call for new regulation, particularly in the gig economy area. The current labor law is not sufficient to cover the gig economy or the kind of uh, platform workers. We have millions of those workers working on the platform economy and, they are, and there is a lot of uh, labor dispute and unclarity and also exploitation by the uh, large platform uh, operators as well. Thank you. Xie Xie Fang, thank you very much. Okay. And thank Stuart, you. would you like to share your screen, Stuart? And, and Fang, thank you for covering such a lot of ground in such a short space of time about a very big and important country like China. And Stuart, on behalf of the UK team and, and Tony, Dobbins, his co-author, is also in the Zoom call, uh, who might join in the discussion. Stuart is speaking from Strathclyde University in Glasgow in Scotland. And over to you, Stuart. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, you can see my, see my slide okay, can you? <laughs> yes, we yeah. can, Stuart. Thank you. <laughs> no, that, that, that's great. Um, so thanks to Greg and the team for inviting Tony and me to be part of this this book um, in its seventh edition. Um, it's the book I used as a student, it's the book I use with my students, so it's great to be part of this, this new edition and to be invited to join the team of um, for, for chapter two on employment relations in the United Kingdom. So what I want to say today is three things really. I want to talk firstly about some of the key things that we discuss in, in the chapter. And then I want to say a little bit about how things have evolved since then um, in the UK, especially in the wake of the, the 2020 pandemic. And then just finally talk about um, some, of, some of the prospects going forward, um, given the disruption that we've seen. So if I start off by just summarising, I guess, some of the things we looked at in, in the chapter, um, trying to contextualise the UK, um, the employment relations system and the labour market context, it's obviously one of the English speaking, lightly regulated liberal market economies. Um, it's an economy now heavily dominated by the private sector um, and in particular private sector services. Um, there is a small and important manufacturing sector, um, but much smaller than it used to be. So much of employment um, and GDP dominated by private sector services. The, the public sector um, is an important employer um, and continues to be, especially healthcare, education and so on. And um, with the NHS itself, the healthcare provider, nationalised healthcare provider, employing over one million people alone. In terms of things that have been important in the UK in the last few decades, I guess, migration has been and continues to be topical. Um, in the last 20 years, the number of EU nationals who had moved to the UK um, had quadrupled to around two million. Um, the number of non-EU nationals who had moved to the UK to work and, and live um, had doubled to around 1 million. It's also a nation that was deeply affected by the global financial crisis back in 2008. And one of the interesting findings there was that the, the impact on the economy, <coughs> seemed to, on jobs, seems to have been less than we might have expected. And there was a bit of a debate as to whether this reflected some sort of flexibility, and if so, what kind of flexibility. But up to around 2020, um, headline economic indicators were positive, employment levels were high, unemployment levels were comparatively low, and there was a general narrative, at least from government, of a successful recovery. But also a lot of concerns um, among scholars of a real squeeze in terms of the quality of employment on offer, um, in terms of pay, low pay, in-work poverty, 
um, and also flexibility, the increased use of flexible working arrangements. So it's a, a nation with a traditional voluntary collective regulation, um, as, about the, as the late Willie Brown noted, that the collapse of collectivism has been one of the key sort of um, attributes or characteristics of the UK, um, with union activity now highly concentrated in certain parts of the economy, um, especially the, the public sector. Most private enterprises now have no collective bargaining at all. And it, for many people in the private sector, their terms and conditions are, are decided unilaterally by, by management. Um, union membership again concentrated in the private sector rather than the private uh, in the public sector rather than the private sector and union members you know, are likely to be particular people people with permanent jobs people in large organizations people that are older or middle-aged and people with a, a middle income um, other, other debates in terms of the changes in, in voice and regulation the flexibility in the gig economy has been a big issue and um, the focus on the jobs the success in terms of jobs, but a lot of concerns about the quality of these jobs. Um, something people like Jill Rubery have, have, have noted, um, the rise of low paid and secure jobs, and that the gig economy has raised particular attention, where, where labour is obviously bought and sold through platforms, and leads to important questions of employment status as to whether these people are self-employed, whether they're workers, whether they're employees, um, because it has really important implications, obviously, as we know, for the, the rights and protections they have or, or will not have. Um, the gig economy has also had important implications for representation um, with the, the rise of, of new unions, for example, to represent workers working in that particular part of the economy. Despite the attention and the controversy, some, some say that you know, gig workers um, um, remain a minority. The CIPD stresses that they remain a minority and also likes to claim as well that a lot of people like to like the flexibility that gig work um, offers, although that statement continues obviously to be highly controversial. And another big theme which we're, we're still dealing with, I guess, is the consequences of Brexit, the withdrawal from the EU, the implications that has for the freedom of movement, the importance of migrant labour to the UK economy, um, and the implication for employment rights, given that a lot of um, UK employment regulation in recent decades um, has, has come out of, the, of EU directives and regulations. So the future on that is uncertain. So those were some of the key themes we, we addressed in the chapter. What we see more recently in the last sort of 12 months, 12 to 15 months or so, is the impact of the pandemic, which has seen social restrictions, school closures, illness, 150,000 deaths in the UK, 1 million people plus suffering from long COVID, and the impact that's had on workers, and I think it really has acted to shine a light on the nature of the labour market because different workers have been affected in different ways and they've had different experiences and different concerns. So we've had those that have lost their job and have been made redundant, people especially in hospitality, retail, manufacturing, those that have entered government supported short time working through the job protection furlough scheme. Yeah. Um, again, most likely to be particular workers, the young, those in hospitality, retail and leisure. But it's thought to have um, saved up to you know, over 11 million jobs, um, and wasn't a, a strat wasn't used in the during the 2008 global financial crisis. So the short time working, um, quite a new thing um, in, in in the UK, I guess. Those who continue to work at the front line, the key workers um, who had issues of health and safety, um, you know, and, and actually delivering services, essential services throughout the pandemic. Um, and those who have, have worked at home, like, like, my, like me, um, for the last 12 to 15 months, um, and the implications for those as well, mostly people who are office-based professional workers. And again, this might be, might be okay for some, but, but not for others. So the experiences of the pandemics really depend who you are and what your concerns are across these various aspects. So whether it's about income security, health and safety, work intensification, and work-life balance. Um, and I guess one of the key things that we've noted so far is the unequal impact of the pandemic, depend, you know, depending upon whether you're young, um, you belong to an ethnic minority, you're in a low paid occupation, or, and, and so on. So a really unequal impact of the pandemic. Looking forward, well, I guess there's been great disruption um, and patterns of you know, what, what will happen in terms of continuity and change. Working arrangements have changed, um, the, the, the shift to home working for many, uh, future discussions about hybrid models and um, the pros and cons of working from home um, 
the, the rights to disconnect, the ability to, to work from anywhere, as well as potential structural changes. So we've seen one of the casualties of the pandemic has been the retail sector and the extent to which e-commerce will mean that's a, a permanent shift um, and, and the implications for employment in that regard and um, the shift in universities to online teaching and the potential for hybrid or online teaching going forward, the creation of, of new jobs. But also now um, we have other labor, labor market implications. We have job shortages in hospitality, um, in the road haulage sector, um, especially as um, many students and European workers are, are not currently available. And I guess finally, my last point, what does this mean for the future of voice? To what extent will worker preferences be taken into account in terms of shaping the future of work going forward? And how do we ensure that with the, the change in working arrangements that employees um, have an effective voice in light of new working arrangements in the future? Thank you. In the middle of the night in the United States, somewhere in New York State, I guess, Harry Katz is the president-elect of ILERA and co-author along with Alex Colbert of the chapter on the United States for this edition and, and earlier editions as well. So take it away, Harry. Thank you for getting up so early. Uh, thanks, thanks, Greg. Yeah, it's uh, uh, 12 minutes before 5 a.m. here in uh, New York. And and also, th thanks for involving me, uh, both as a speaker here and in, in the continuing uh, role of the book and for all the work you and the editors have done on it. Um, so I'll, I'm going to focus on sort of a recent developments uh, in, the, in the United States and, and assume that that uh, many and probably all of you know much about the basic features of the U.S. Um, labor relations system. Um, when I teach my undergraduates and I'm talking about recent developments, I, I often do the simple thing of going to the blackboard and drawing a sad face and a happy face and talk about the developments uh, that are both sad for the labor movement and those that are more uh, positive. Um, so let me let me just use that simple uh, distinction and start with the sad face. And, and that is that, um, as you uh, probably are aware, the level of unionism and union coverage, we don't have legal extension in the United States, the coverage in the private sector is extremely limited. It's down to 6.5% of the workforce in the private sector uh, belongs to unions and is uh, effectively covered by collective bargaining uh, arrangements. Um, there's been enormous amount of activity by unions trying to reverse that, many very innovative organizing and representation uh, strategies, uh, but they've not uh, proven uh, to reverse that, that trend. Um, the latest example is the high hopes that existed uh, regarding the efforts by workers at an Amazon uh, f uh, warehouse, a large warehouse, as many Amazon warehouses are, uh, with several thousand workers in Bessemer, Alabama, um, member of many, many of them black workers and many of them facing, as you probably know from both movies and journalistic accounts, uh, pretty uh, hard, tough work conditions uh, made even harder by uh, the conditions uh, during the pandemic. In addition, we had uh, President Biden uh, for, for the first time in, in my own uh, lifetime, the president uh, talking favorably, openly in the press and on various forums about unionism, about how unionism and collective bargaining is a good thing. And so many, many people, many journalists said, this is it, this is the turning point. The workers are gonna organize it Amazon, and that's going to lead the way. And not not only did the unionization campaign uh, fail, but it resoundingly uh, failed with a, a very limited support for the union. There's lots of debate about whether that's due to the legal restrictions uh, on union activity by management activity and, or by um, the conditions within the culture of Alabama, et cetera, or the nature of the campaign the unions did or didn't run. But nonetheless, 
there hasn't been a turnaround uh, evident. Um, uh, the labor movement has high hopes uh, for passage of what's referred to as the PRO Act, a, 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 a really extensive effort to uh, legislatively change things at the federal level. As you may recall, uh, federal legislation has not comprehensively changed in the United States uh, since 1959, even in the face of several efforts uh, to, to uh, change it. Um, and the labor movement is, is spending a lot, a lot of its political capital in an effort to try and pass the PRO Act. Um, I and, and, and some others are very dubious that that act will pass, and even more so, I uh, am dubious that even if it passed, which I don't think will happen, I don't think it will have the enormous effects the labor movement hopes for, but I don't think that will ever get tested. Um, the other negative thing to mention is, and, and Alex Colvin is really my co-author, is very uh, 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 active in researching on this score, is the, the increased impact of decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court on labor relations. We haven't had uh, legislative change, but we've had a very aggressive uh, U.S. Supreme Court um, in various decisions uh, uh, affecting labor relations. And perhaps the most important is a 20-year series of decisions that allow uh, firms uh, to impose mandatory employment arbitration, as it's referred to, requiring that employees, instead of having, instead of having the ability of going to court to pursue a case on discrimination or harassment of any sort, and any other employment right are mandated to uh, proceed with that dispute through employment arbitration. In addition, um, there's uh, decisions af affecting the public sector, uh, a Janus decision where the court uh, basically up upheld limitations on the uh, collection of dues by uh, members within uh, unions in the, in the public sector. So that's, that's the sad face, uh, a stagnant, uh, and low levels of unionism in the private sector, and even in the face of enormous effort and activity, uh, no sign of a turnaround, even with a favorable uh, presidential administration. Um, the, the, the more positive, um, may, maybe even one would say happy face, I'm not sure it's so happy, but it's at least more positive than that's, that gloomy outlook, <clears throat> is a series of things that have gone on. Um, um, and that is uh, unionism is low in the private sector, but in the public sector, uh, it is much higher and it has sustained itself. Uh, approximately 36% of all public employees, whether they work at the federal, the state government, or at the municipal city level, are uh, members of unions and covered by collective bargaining. Um, and that level of unionism has held up. Uh, some would say surprisingly, even in the face of the Janus decision, even in the face of efforts at various state level, initially led in Wisconsin by Governor Scott Walker and, and, and at other state levels, uh, public sector unionism appears to be uh, alive and, and well. In addition, there were a series of wildcat strikes. You may have started to hear about those a couple of years ago appearing somewhat surprisingly in uh, school systems, uh, elementary and secondary schooling for those uh, at kindergarten up through uh, 12th grade, um, uh, teachers. And, and the surprising element was that activism appeared in states like West Virginia uh, and in Oklahoma, uh, where uh, uh, unions are not strong. And the activity uh, uh, initially occurred outside the, outside the jurisdiction and in some ways outside uh, the uh, activities of the uh, important unions that exist that represent school teachers in a number of states, the AFT and NEA. Um, uh, in addition, there's been activity by uh, teachers not to be minimized in those districts where they do have union, uh, historical union representation. Um, there also are many rights groups uh, that have been quite active uh, taxi drivers, uh, home care worker alliances, domestic workers, uh, farm workers through a uh, really fascinating uh, coalition called the Amokali Coalition, particularly active in Florida. Many rights groups appearing and carrying out collective actions 
that are outside of collective bargaining. Um, and and it, it's a really open question um, what those activities will lead to uh, the, uh, and all, but nonetheless, they're there. Um, uh, in addition, uh, even in the private sector where the level of unionism, as I mentioned, uh, is remains uh, extremely modest, uh, the unions uh, are still active in, in the automobile sector, in transportation, in professional sports. And unions have been active during the pandemic, uh, particularly at the workplace level, providing substantial and aggressive support for workers, often succeeding uh, at ensuring uh, better personal uh, protection, uh, maybe not everything that, that, that the workforce and everyone had hoped for, but uh, flexing their muscle and often succeeding at providing the kind of representation that doesn't exist uh, where unions are, are absent in the United States. There's also interestingly be, been a lot of success on the legislative front, not just the election of the Biden administration, one shouldn't minimize uh, that, but in addition, uh, state level legislative action uh, uh, about the minimum wage uh, in a number of states, uh, including somewhat surprisingly, again, the state of Florida, uh, which did go in the latest election for Trump, uh, they passed uh, a, a, a substantial rise in the minimum wage. But in addition, in, in traditionally a, a stronger union oriented states on, on the West Coast and the East Coast, uh, not only uh, substantial raises in the minimum wage at the state level, but a legislative action uh, at times trying to reverse or limit the consequences of that those Supreme Court decisions, actions trying to limit, for example, uh, a mandatory uh, arb arbitration. Um, so um, last but not least, uh, I will also say Although I won't say much about it here, I'll talk more about it in my plenary session remarks later this morning. Um, overall, um, e even though in the face of low levels of unionism in the private sector, in the face of the sharp economic decline of the pandemic, um, there's been a very, very strong uh, governmental response. Uh, uh, it doesn't look to me as if one would characterize the response in the last year and a half as uh, neoliberalism of the sort that some of our colleagues have said uh, we're all uh, doomed to suffer from uh, uh, forevermore. Um, a very strong action uh, taken by the federal government, uh, even with the support of Republicans in Congress uh, who are not willing to support much else uh, uh, these days. Uh, there was direct support by the federal government for unemployment insurance. This typically does not occur in the United States. Unemployment insurance occurs in our federalist system at the state level. And then strong direct payments by the federal government um, uh, to uh, various enterprises, uh, small enterprise, enterprise in the airline sector, enterprise in the hospitality sector. Again, not very common in the United States for the federal government to providing direct payments uh, to unemployed workers and to provide direct payments to enterprises to help them stay afloat. Again, I'm not saying that, that the, the government did everything uh, all of us social Democrats would hope for, but it looked more like a social democratic sort of intervention than a pure neoliberal sort of intervention. So again, imagine that. You have a Supreme Court uh, uh, aggressively limiting unionism. Uh, a private sector unionism is still uh, a low, and yet you have a very, very aggressive action at the federal level and increasing action at the state level. I'll stop it. Harry, that. Yes. Thank, thank you very much, Harry. Yeah. Um, and we look forward to hearing you say more at your, at your plenary keynote address a little later today. So thank you for covering the ground of the big United States for us. And konnichiwa. Now we pass to uh, Professor Kubo Sensei, who is at Waseda University. And thank you for sharing your slides, Professor Kubo. And please move, let us move to Japan. Thank, thank you. you very much for the introduction. And 
and I'm very happy to be here to join this World Congress. And uh, today I'm going to talk on employment relationship in Japan. And uh, well, I'm going to talk on the you know traditional employment relationship, then the response of those you know labor market response to the COVID nineteen and the globalizations. Well, <clears throat> firstly, I I would like to briefly explain the context of employment relationship in Japan, and the one very important characteristics of trade union in Japan is that it's enterprise based. Well, the workers typically regular workers working in the same companies form a union. And uh, you know, there's association of and um, trade unions across sectors, then across all businesses. And the trade unions are trying to recruit more on non-regular workers, but not very successful. Still the unionization rate is very low for non-regular workers, less than 10%. And the, the problem is those enterprise-based union react properly to the COVID-19 pandemic and the globalizations. And uh, firstly, I'm going to talk about the government <clears throat> response to the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, of course, you know, as in many countries, you know, the government is doing a lot of things. Mainly, you know, the subsidies to loans to companies you know, to sustain the businesses. And uh, from the labor market perspectives, the important thing is that this short-term compensation package, this is Koyo Chosei Joseikin, which, you know, is a subsidy program to companies which keep employment. Suppose there are companies whose the amount of sales decline, say more than 30%, or, you know, for the restaurant who need to close their businesses in response to the state of emergency request. And, uh, and uh, still, they keep employment. If they keep employment during those closure, <clears throat> they can receive subsidies from the government. And uh, of course, you know, and, and the, the eligibility conditions for those pack, uh, you know, compensation package is relaxed. And uh, this package itself exists before the COVID-19 era. And that this is not, you know, usually used. You know, it is typically used in the large crisis, like global financial crisis and the 2011 Great Earthquake. And the, the government encouraged employers, you know, to change their work style, so subsidies to help remote work and something. And the, firstly, I'm going to look into several figures. You know how the effect of COVID-19 on labor market, looking at the unemployment rate and the labor adjustment by companies. And the, I'm going to show who are suffered by the COVID-19. And the, this, I have two figures, both show the changing unemployment rate. The right-hand side is the changing unemployment rate during COVID-19 crisis. And the, the, uh, you know, as a comparison, I showed the changing unemployment rate during the global financial crisis in 2008 and 9. And uh, well, first of all, looking at the right hand side, there, there is a slight increase, you know, from two, you know, in unemployment rate from say 2.4% in April 9, 2019 to 2.8% 2 in April 2021. So the increase is not, does not you know, look very large. And the, you know, the impact looks not so large, say, compared with the global financial crisis. And uh, I'm going to show the next figure, which shows the proportions of companies which conduct some sort of, you know, the reduction in labor impacts. And uh, well, this shows the proportion of companies which conduct the reduction in labor impacts in this two period, COVID-19 pandemic and the global financial crisis. And uh, if we look at the right-hand side, well, there's a increase. And uh, well, not very small, the figure is not small, it's around 50%. So why in two companies do some kind of, you know, reduction in labor impacts? But you know, the reduction in 
labor inputs does not necessarily mean layoff or dismissal. That mainly they do more soft version of doing that, say limiting overtime work or increasing holidays and uh, well, stop hiring new graduate, stop hiring mid hires, and uh, importantly by dismissal of the normal regular workers. Then they solicit voluntary retirement. Then finally they do layoffs. So, <clears throat> and you know, again, there, there are fifty percent of companies are doing some some kind what that kind of thing. But and it looks smaller. The, the impact of the COVID nineteen crisis looks smaller compared with the global financial crisis. And uh, this figure is based on the same stats, and it shows the proportion of companies which lay off people. And uh, well, clearly in 2020, you know, 15, you know, 17% of the work in you know, companies lay off people. So they're reducing the, well, the number of employees. But importantly, again, you know, before layoff, they're doing many things, you know, by stopping hiring new graduate and the uh, dismissal of non-regular workers. So actually they are keeping the employment of the regular workers, well, by using the new graduate and the non-regular workers as a kind of buffers. So I'm going to show this from the different perspective. And uh, this is the change in the number of regular and non-regular workers. You know, the change in the number of workers. The red one is the non-regular workers and the blue one is the regular workers. So it shows who has suffered during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, it is clear that, you know, the red line is very negative while, you know, the blue line is positive. That means, you know, the employment of the regular worker is protected. But the you know the company heavily reduced the <clears throat> employment of the non-regular workers, so which is very consistent with the previous uh, figures. And uh, I show you this for the male and the female version. So this is a different figure, which shows changing the number of workers, male and female. So who are suffered, you know, male and the female version. And again, there's a reduction in workforce in 2020 something. And, uh, but it, it looks clear that, you know, the, the employment of the female workers decreases more than the employment of male workers. Of course, you know, many proportion of the female workforce are non-regular workers. More than 50% of the female workforce are non-regular workers. So that's not surprising. But again, you know, it is shown that, you know, the unemployment rate is relatively simple, but that's achieved by reducing the employment of female workers and the non-regular workers and stop hiring of the new graduate. And uh, I'm going to go the next thing. The Just one, 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 and a, one and a half minutes left okay so please thank you so i, I would yeah. like to stop in one minute so i'd like to talk about the globalization the different thing and uh well my, one of the most important aspect of globalization in japan is that you know strongest you know <clears throat> the stronger power of the financial market capital market that leads to the you know more mergers acquisitions divestures the sale of the union and the company or something like that and that there are many institutional change to strengthen the power of the you know capital market. And uh, well, there's one very big impact on the enterprise, you know, the trade union employment relationship. Well, those regulations are on the financial market, and the only expert on the financial market are called when they are reform capital market. But you know, considering this is an enterprise-based unions, when company two companies merges the enterprise-based union merges as well. And the one company split into two, you know, the, so does the enterprise-based enterprise union. So there is a huge impact on the globalization, <clears throat> the huge impact on employment relationship. Um, then 
well, and then we need to think how, what's happening here. And that's all. Thank you very much. Domo arigato. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Sensei Kuba. Arigato um, and, and Japan's another. All of these countries are so interesting. I just wish we had more time uh, to get drilled down into the detail which you and other contributors do in your various chapters in the book. But now we have an opportunity to have some discussion and question and answer. And my good colleague and friend from Sydney University, um, Chris Wright, is going to moderate the question and answer discussion. And Chris is a co-editor with us on the book, not only on the current edition, but also the previous edition as well. Over to you, Chris. Uh, thanks, Greg. And I might just take the opportunity to thank uh, all of the contributors and presenters, uh, LED. Fang, Stuart, Harry, and Katsuyuki uh, for your wonderful presentations. Um, and also to Mia for uh, very generously taking the time to launch the book. Um, so I mean, one of the challenges I might just say before we get into the question and answers was, uh, was producing this book in the middle of COVID because the uh, first drafts of the chapters were due just before the pandemic. Little did we know um, the pandemic hit. And then we had the task going back to the authors and saying, uh, if you could uh, try to incorporate some of the initial responses of governments and employers and unions to the crisis. And, uh, and it was great to get a sense of that in the presentations there and, and to hear some of the similarities that are emerging, uh, perhaps evidence of convergence around uh, you know, the use of government subsidies, increase in working from home arrangements, and also the uneven impacts across many of the countries, you know, women typically uh, bearing a disproportionate burden of the, of the crisis than men and insecure workers uh, and younger workers compared to secure and older workers. Uh, and I guess these are things that, that will be the focus of much comparative work in the coming years, I'm sure. So without any further ado, let's, uh, we've got about 15 minutes for question and discussion. Uh, and we have uh, one question already uh, from Johan Marie, who asks, uh, are there any informal work organizations in workplaces that are trying to improve working conditions in China? So Fang, I might just put this question to you first, but um, this is a question also for, um, for potential um, consideration from the other contributors, because it is something of a theme that we saw through several other chapters in the book around the rise of informal work organizations. So Fang, um, what's your response to that, that question? Yeah. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Johan, for your question. Um, there has always been some forms of uh, um, NGOs organizing the informal workers or the workers in the manufacturing uh, com uh, companies, especially in the export-oriented zones in the uh, southeast part of the China. Um, but these are quite localized and um, it does not last very long or does not form a sustained kind of force of uh, workers organizing uh, independent from the state or from the uh, official trade unions uh, organizing. Um, in addition to the NGOs organizing in the localized area in the Southeast area, we also see workers themselves uh, having spontaneous kind of uh, protests or, or disputes and uh, industrial actions towards uh, against the employers um, and, and on occasions have been against the uh, local governments as well for poor pace and conditions. But um, I mean, things like this uh, have been going on before COVID and to some to a much lesser extent during COVID. Thanks, Fang. And I might just ask the other presenters and other uh, contributors uh, if this is something that, uh, that you see is potentially significant in, in the countries that you've uh, written on, at the rise of informal and also perhaps other types of non-union organisations like community-based organisations. Is this something that we're seeing becoming important actors in employment relations? Chris, you're asking other country, right? Yeah, Tony, did, yeah. did you want to say something about the UK? Yeah, um, thanks, Chris. 
Yeah, and thanks for the question. I suppose in, in the UK context, um, you've had a, a number of grassroots uh, unofficial smaller unions emerging, for example, in the gig economy, uh, and that they're taking on the big gig economy employers like like Uber and Deliveroo. So, and they, they've just emerged almost organic, organically from the, the grassroots, like the independent works of, of, of Great Britain, um, quite small, quite agile unions, yeah, who, who, who are emerging, particularly in the, in the gig economy. In terms of, um, you've got also civil society organisations like um, the Living Wage Foundation in the in the UK, which have emerged to tackle the problem of um, the chronic problem of low pay in in the UK, and, and they're they're known as civil society organisations. So that they've been emerging in recent years as well, um, partly reflecting the vacuum left by um, lack of trade union representation and coverage, particularly in the private sector. So they'd be two examples of, um, firstly, of unofficial um, new trade unions in the gig economy, and then secondly, new, uh, new civil society organisations like the UK Live and Wage Foundation. Thanks very much for that, Tony, and also Fang for your answers to that, those questions. Um, Marion Baird, has, uh, my good colleague at Sydney University, has two very interesting questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, whether the, uh, the chapter authors could comment about the labour force participation rates among males and females during COVID, so participation rates as opposed to unemployment rates, uh, and, and whether you see any structural shifts in the labour markets? And secondly, the role that unions played uh, during the pandemic, uh, and particularly the extent to which they bargained or argued for paid leaves, um, such as paid pandemic leave, uh, rather than wage increases or, or wage demands. Um, so I'll open that up um, to the, the country's capital town. So maybe I'll talk very quickly about the U.S. Um, it, it's certainly been the case in the U.S., <clears throat> similar to Japan, that that women have been hit much harder by the decline in, in employment during the pandemic. Um, uh, what remains to be seen is whether that's a longer term structural adjustment or whether it's a product of the fact that, that women still bear, as we all know, the burden of a family and children child care and with many of the school systems um, either closed or operating on a limited basis that women were staying home disproportionately and, and haven't yet fully returned uh, because the school systems uh, were were closed or limited again in the US in the in the fall the projection our fall the projection is as of September the school systems to be reopened and we'll see we also will see what happens as a consequence, as was mentioned by others, of the increase in um, digital-based work, of distance work, that, that, that may lead to a return of, of employment of a sort that, that's different from previous recoveries. Paid leave, interestingly, again, the federal government in the US historically uh, had, had, uh, had not provided a, a paid leave and yet did provide some paid leave as a as part of the uh, legislative action during the pandemic um, unions did argue for more at the local level unions at the local level were particularly arguing for extensions of medical care coverage because we had we don't have a national system and so when people were laid off the question was what did they continue to get medical care and again the stronger unions were able to negotiate at least more than management was willing to give, even though not necessarily everything they hoped for. I'll stop at that. Thanks, Harry. Um, Melody. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'll just give a few 
elements regarding the second question about paid leave and paid pandemic leave um, in France. Uh, it has been discussed as well, and it has been obtained in some cases. And I think, as for instance, when employees could justify that they needed this leave to take care of their children, in particular when the schools were closed. So it was a paid pandemic leave, but a conditional to uh, the fact that you had your kids at home and you had to take care of them. So, uh, it, but it's been discussed in this uh, perspective, for instance. Um, would any of the other uh, chapter contributors like to address those questions? Perhaps Johan or, or Bernd. Was were those issues that came uh, that were that came up in uh, in South Africa or or um, Germany around um, structural changes in um, the gender participation rates or um, unions calling for or advocating pandemic? Well, I would I would like to mention another point. Uh, and that's the, uh, the increase, well, in informal work or what we would call in, in Western Europe atypical work or contingent work or what has been called in the US precarious work. So I guess all country authors should pay more attention in the forthcoming <laughs> next edition to this topic. And qu quite obviously, and this is a worldwide, almost worldwide trend the number and the percentage of, of these atypical workers or employees has increased over the last two to three, maybe four decades. And it is quite likely that the number will even increase more because of digitalization and maybe even because of the COVID pandemic. But I'm pretty sure about digitalization. And uh, there are some problems to be found everywhere. So usually, usually the density ratio of these employees is fairly low. So their bargaining power is also pretty low. Their wages are far below average. Their working conditions are precarious and so on and so forth. So I guess this is an important general trend we should uh, put more emphasis to in, in all our forthcoming publications, not only in the global south, but also in fairly developed industrial uh, countries and their industrial relations. Thanks, Ben. About yeah. South Africa, um, it, 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 the uh, gender women were harder hit uh, in the pandemic. Uh, a far greater proportion of them lost their jobs, but there's general, general gender discrimination. They're still mostly in lower occupies, lower posts, and and. Uh, we're in more, more vulnerable positions. Um, but uh, South Africa in this sense is, is different that uh, gender discrimination is minor compared to race discrimination. Um, the, the immense inequalities are still between the different races in the country. And of course, the impact there has been, uh, and it has got terribly high unemployment. We are now standing at a 33% unemployment rate. Um, uh, so so th th those are factors that uh, are very prominent in, in South Africa. Uh, and just a little bit more, we have a very strong public sector union. They all negotiate in one forum and they are paid much better than private sector workers, but they are threatening to strike if they don't get the increases they're demanding at the moment. So we might face a strike by 1.3 million public sector workers within the next few weeks. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, Johan. We have two questions that have come through the chat, and this, I think, might, will take us to the uh, end of the session. So the first one's from Braden Ellum, uh, who, um, who says that they're listening to Elodie, Fang and Harry. It seems that the state is the key player in the structures of industrial relations. Uh, is, that, is that the case? And, and if so, does this jar with the traditional focus of the varieties of capitalism framework, which I guess remains the dominant um, theoretical framework for comparing different national employment relations systems. So I might open this up to anyone who wants to answer it. Is, are we seeing a, a reassertion of the state uh, in national employment relations systems? And, uh, and does this, if so, does this leave it, require us to come up with perhaps a new theory of comparative employment relations? Anyone want to answer that question? Harry, perhaps, uh, or, or Fang or Elodie, given that uh, it, the questions 
Uh, like thanks, Chris. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, it is true that um, suddenly in China, uh, the role of the state has become more accentuated uh, in the in organizing the employment and employment relations and in other aspects of the work and life as well in China at the moment. And in fact, in the conclusion of our book, um, this uh, edited volume, uh, we did say that there are several areas which is converging. And one of that is the role of the state uh, in kind of... Uh, Converging, it, although the role of the state is borne out in different ways in different countries, uh, some through more um, a stronger role in legislation um, in the democratic countries and others uh, in through uh, the more hands-on organizing of employment. Um, thanks very much for that, Fang. Um, Marion uh, provides a very interesting comment observation in the, in the chat that um, is it the case that the state's operating more in the welfare sphere rather than the industrial relations sphere? I guess particularly in terms of the COVID responses. And can these spheres clearly be separated now, particularly as, as they have been, I guess, theoretically, um, welfare state seen as a kind of a separate area, but I guess we are seeing perhaps more of an overlap these days. I might just, uh, give the last um, word in terms of questions to Marilyn Pittard, a Professor of uh, Employment Law at Monash. Thanks, Marilyn, for this question. Uh, firing and rehiring employees on lower wages by employers has been a feature of uh, the UK in the, during the pandemic. So Stuart or, or Tony, perhaps, um, could you comment a bit about this, uh, if, if that's the case? Yeah, I, I think um, the fire and rehire in the UK has caused a, a lot of controversy um, over the, the last year or so, um, especially as businesses think about, you know, what's happening going forward. There's been cases that have attracted quite a lot of news coverage in this regard. Um, British Gas, seeming, you know, just thinking of one in particular in terms of rehiring people on um, reapplying for their jobs and rehiring them on, um, I guess, inferior terms and conditions. Um, I guess, ACAS have been looking at this in the UK and they've suggested it's not entirely a new practice, um, but there's, there's a suggestion that it has become more common in the last year or so. Um, and the TUC has suggested it might be up to sort of one in 10 people um, in this situation in, in the last year. So quite a lot of um, pressure from, from, organized, um, from unions um, and others um, in terms of this, this practice, which is not necessarily um, unlawful, it has been suggested, but whether, you know, obviously, in terms of good employment practice, um, important implications. I don't know if, if Tony has anything to, to add to what I just said there. Is Tony here? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Jairus. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's been um, opportunism by often large, highly profitable employers like, like British Gas, to engage in um, firing and rehiring practices. And the problem is uh, the system of employment law in the UK is no, it seems to me is no longer fit for purpose. Um, it's outdated. Um, there, have, there aren't sufficient protections to, to prevent employers opportunities opportunistically engaging in firing and rehiring practices. Uh, the Conservative, UK Conservative government um, are supposed to be implementing an employment bill to help strengthen protections in the labour market, but that hasn't yet appeared. So, yeah, I think it's been opportunism by particular large profitable employers using COVID opportunistically to, to engage in these kind of exploitative practices. And the system of employment law needs strengthening in the UK. It's outdated. Thanks very much for that, Tony and Stuart. Um, so we're one minute uh, to, before time. So um, it seems like a, a good um, moment to uh, conclude the session. I just want to thank um, everyone who is involved in this, um, all of the uh, country chapter authors and presenters, uh, and Mia and Greg, 
and to everyone else who came along and for the great questions. Um, thank you very much for your time and for your contributions. Uh, and thanks also um, to the ILERA support team um, uh, who um, provided such great support behind the scenes. Um, so particularly Hedvig. Uh, thanks Mia uh, and uh, for organizing such a great Congress. It'd be great to be in Lund, but this is a pretty good second, um, <laughs> second option, I think, and, uh, and really appreciate everything you've done. Um, so enjoy the rest of your time at the World Congress, everyone. Um, hope to see you in other sessions and thank you very much for coming to this one. Thank you. Thank you. For, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Chris, for organizing and sharing the session. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Right. And thank you. See, you, thank see you. you at another session, not, not least the uh, address that Harry Katz has gave us a taster of in, in his <laughs> discussion here. So th Thanks. thank you, everyone. Mm. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Have a nice day. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs>